Welcome. Good welcome, evening. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Woo! Welcome, welcome. So some of you raised your hand in the community center and said you had never been to Atlanta Tech Village before. Can you raise your hand again? Oh. Wonderful. All right. All right. See me afterwards, please. See all of you. <laughs> See me afterwards. Well, we first want to say thank you to all of our first timers and everyone else who was here. And we have a little, we have a little uh, prize we'll give out in a second for our first timer as soon as our first company sets up. But we want to say thank you for being here. You are in Atlanta Tech Village. This is the perpetual sponsor of Atlanta Startup Village. And in here is over a thousand entrepreneurs, lots of events to help you become a better entrepreneur, a stronger entrepreneur, as well as have amazing communities. So again, please make sure to reach out to Richard yes. afterwards if you're interested in learning more. And again, we thank you for joining us here. And it's Women's History Month. So we want to thank, yes! yes. Shout out yes. to my ladies! Yes. <laughs> And we want to thank all the amazing women that are part of the team here at Atlanta Tech Village that keep this ship running because this is a lot of square footage, y'all. This is like over 100,000 square feet. 100,000. Over 1,000 people. So you already know that's, that's a lot of hurting <laughs> going on on the daily. So thank you to you ladies. And we also want to say thank you to Kristen, who was our host in 2023, our co-host here. She is um, at Tech AF, and we're so excited. And we're excited for our new co-host, Richard! Hello, Oh, shucks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, I'm just here just having a good time. Thank you again for everyone for coming and being your wonderful entrepreneurial selves. Back to you, Christian. Well, well, we are here at Atlanta Startup Village number 95, meaning this has happened 94 times before this one. OK, so, you know, in Atlanta years ago, this wasn't a thing. Now you can go. You can go on Eventbrite. You can find a million pitch competitions. But I just want you to know you're you're in the home of the OGs right here in Atlanta, okay? And we've had some things that have changed. So one, we used to have an audience favorite, that's who won, and that's who will go to our pitch off. Not anymore, because we have judges! Oh! All right, first we have <laughs> the amazing Allie Mayer. Give it up for Allie, everybody. She is our managing director here at Atlanta Tech Village, also now the managing director of our downtown location, she has spent over a decade communicating and also supporting startups within the community as well as advancing local startups as well as on the national stage. So please make sure you say hello to Allie and give her a round of applause. P, everybody, please. All right, next we have Christian. Oh, okay. We have Mr. Landon Howe. He is a marketing expert, a startup advisor, and he is also a Techstars mentor in, res re mentor in residence. So he literally just got back from Dublin, y'all. Like, he's going around worldwide helping uh, startups. So thank you so much. And if you go to his website, LandonHow.com, yes, <laughs> and you sign up for his newsletter, y'all, the funniest video comes up. So I just want to put that out there, that if you want some extra good spring will, Go to LandonHow.com. Last. Oh, yeah, of course. Vita Raptor Landon. I apologize for cutting off your applause. <laughs> I didn't mean to, Landon, on that one. Last but not least, we have Anastasia Simon. Give it up for Anastasia, everybody, please. <laughs> Anastasia is an investment principal at Techstars, an investment guru with a dynamic set of expertise. And I said that wrong. Someone help me out. You get her next prize. I said expertise, oh, but what should it be? Expertise. There it is. You get a prize, my friend, Mr. Sensel. <laughs> of course, a dynamic set of expertise. Anastasia is passionate about supporting underrepresented founders, building equitable, sustainable communities, and also, one more thing, being an amazing judge here at Atlanta Tech Village. Give it a round of applause for Anastasia. <laughs> we were waiting on that, right? I was like, what happened? What happened? No, I'm Oh, we got to give love to all of our judges, everybody. Thank yeah. you so much. So we're so thankful for our judges. So those are one of the big changes. We have judges, as well as we are on quarterly meetings now instead of bi-monthly. So every quarter you can come right here, see amazing companies. And we're not going to talk any further. We are going to let our first company come up, Cogbias AI. And we're going to make sure we give that first prize out. So let's see. If you're a first-timer, Where's the furthest that you came from today? 
Yes. Okay. Oh, Dallas. Dallas. And what's your name? Dariel, nice to meet you. Dallas. All right, my friend in the back. See, oh. and what's your name? Jamie. Okay, I right. think you beat Seattle. No one. No, I don't see any other hands raised. Oh, what, what was that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got a prize coming for you. All right, Jamie, we got one for you as well. We'll do it right afterwards. But first up, we have Cog Bias AI. Give it up. <laughs> Hey everybody, my name is Tolly Shillman. I'm co-founder and CEO of Cogbias AI. Uh, we believe that better questions lead to better decisions. So because of that, we decided to solve a problem. And it's a massive problem. In fact, we all have it in this room. We ask the wrong questions. We have ideas, we manage projects, we run corporations. And when we go about asking, whether it's marketing research or customer discovery, when we go ask those questions, what do we get? We start asking questions that confirm our things. We, want, we don't want to hear bad news. We want to hear good things. We want people to love our product and be delighted by it. So we ask questions that confirm our ideas. We ask questions that have obvious answers. We also ask questions that frame our idea well. That means after we tell them about our idea, we ask them, what do you think? And of course, nobody's going to tell you, this stinks. <laughs> but you know, this is a small thing, but it's a multi-billion. In fact, it's in the tens of billions dollar thing. And you've probably seen examples, but I'll give you an example that happened to me. Right after business school, I started my job at a multinational pharmaceutical company as a brand manager, a cough, an adult cough cold brand. And I came in at the tail end of a three-year project. It was an innovation to create an at-home testing kit for the flu. And I had not been to a true marketing research study before. And when I was invited, I was kind of floored by the fact that one of the main questions that was being asked in many different forms was, what do you want to know if you had the flu? How many people here would want to know if they had the flu? Probably everybody. So one of those obvious answers. My favorite second question that was asked was, would you want to know if you had the flu? This is actual wording. Would you want to know if you had the flu if, without having to go to the doctor? Again, it's a thing that just you know, drives you nuts. And obviously, obvious answers. Surprisingly, unsurprisingly, after $20 million and three and a half years of time, the project was canceled a year, uh, about a month before it was launched. Why? Because retailers notified the company that they did their own internal sales checks and discovered there was no market need. So what happens is we tend to do this. We put garbage in and we get garbage out. We ask bad questions, we get bad answers, and we make decisions based on those answers. So, you know, what's the right question, right? What is the right question? The right question... Uh, well, there's a lot of ways to explain it to you, but one of the easiest ways to say it is you don't want a question that biases your respondent to answer in the way that the user wants. In other words, if you ask a question and with an expectation of a certain answer, you're biasing them. So we created a solution. We created uh, Cogbias AI, which is literally named for cognitive bias because we're not terribly original with names. It's a marketing research platform it allows you to create, to create a 360 degree view of questions. That means you can use context and you will be able to test all the questions that you're putting out there, whether it's questionnaires, surveys, or in a person conversation, and we'll be able to tell you how biased are these questions, which direction are they going in, what are the possible rephrases or recommendations to change the questions. And you know, when we talk back, uh, look back at that funny little thing I told you about the company used to work at and those questions, we put one of the questions into our system. And we'd said, would you want to know if you had the flu? And our suggested rephrase was, take me through how you'd respond if you knew you had the flu. What steps might you take? That would be a far more interesting thing. Uh, to date, our traction is we're running a closed beta of 100 plus users. We've had over 2,000 questions asked, over 10,000 recommendations made. Uh, at the end of this, you'll be able also to sign up for the beta if you want. Uh, we've done our TAM and SAM and all this other stuff, and it's a massive market. Marketing research and product management alone add up to $2.3 billion in opportunity for us. We're aware of all the other verticals we could be hitting, so believe me, they're all in the roadmap. Our competition, and that's the weird part, what we've realized and after much research, we really, we have competition with everything, whether it's the Excel sheet, whether it's SurveyMonkey, whether it's McKinsey. 
The thing that we've realized is that we're the only ones out there that automated the process of bias detection and being able to actually spot, get a 360 degree view of your question. Right now, most places, what they do is either it's a lot of manpower or they give you a positive or a negative feel, but they will not tell you if the context is right. So what's next, right? The next thing is the most important thing. Well, we're gonna be creating APIs and plugins and extensions. If you know about Grammarly, the power of Grammarly is the fact that it exists in everything. That's our future. We're going to be in your Qualtrics platform, SurveyMonkey, Suzy, Salesforce. We're also going to be in your email. So as you ask questions and you answer questions, you'll be able to see the impact. Uh, we have a team that's rich in experience. 20 years in AI, 45 patents. We have a PhD on the team. We've seen it, we've done it, we've failed at it. And that's why we can actually build it. But we're raising 1.5 million in the funding round. And that's gonna give us 24 month runway. It's gonna get us up to 100,000 a month in revenue, 10,000 customers, but cooler than everything else, it's going to allow us to build the, our own LLM and get off of the general AIs that you see out here so we can create secure platforms. You know, it's very interesting what we're building because I said so, because I'm biased. But honestly, I think I would love to be able to help everybody ask better questions. So, you know, feel free to scan the code or go to cockbias.ai and use the code for friendly bias and you'll get a month free. Check us out. That'll be different is that our judges will ask questions. There'll be three minutes of judges' questions and two minutes of audience questions. Can you hear me? There we go. <laughs> you said some of the money you raise will be used to build your own LLM. So where is the information now? What are you pulling off of? We, we, okay. <laughs> what we're actually pulling it from, uh, we're, we have, we're all the latest academia on the 219 known uh, cognitive biases that are out there, we're pulling it off of there. Our underpinning currently is open AI, strictly for data gathering, and also to keep our costs down. Ultimately, we believe that it's not the best pathway forward, especially if we're going to create secure expert data sets. Hello? Okay. So, <laughs> so weird. Okay, so that was, I was going to ask that question, actually. Um, that's fine. Uh, so the next question, I guess, would be, so tell me a little bit more about who your buyer is. What we've noticed, and it's a, a little backstory, I guess. This was originally created as an internal tool for the three of us as we were planning to build other things. And uh, somebody got a hold of us from product management, and then they said, do you know what I do half my time? Ask questions. And I have no idea what I'm asking. And uh, because we built it for ourselves to actually, for our own customer discovery assets, we realized that who are our true customers initially? It's product managers, it's marketing researchers. Marketing researchers both internally in the corporate side and marketing research firms. Talk to me a little bit more about the concept of bias in AI, since we all know that that's kind of unfortunately built in, again, garbage in, garbage out. How are you guys gonna filter for that in the future from the AI itself? Uh, that's a, actually, again, something interesting. Background on the, on the story, again. our CTO, who unfortunately could not be here because busy being a dad, um, he originally came up with this concept about 15 years ago when he was working on a PhD project to figure out if he could detect uh, suicidal tendencies, which is the ultimate form of biases. And uh, that's when the realization came, well, biases in AI, how can we get rid of them? We can never truly get rid of them, just so we, like, we can never truly get rid of our own biases. What, what we help you do is direct biases. You'll never see, like, this is not a biased question. It always is biased. But the key element for us is we constantly filter and refilter. We look for, or, or, one of the things we're going to do that we are unable to do now is when we build our own LM, we'll do expert data, data labeling. We are working closely on developing a contract with several academia sites where graduate students uh, within the PhD in psychology program will be doing labeling. And while it won't guarantee 100% no bias, it allows us to stay close and constantly check ourselves over and over again. Yes.
Honestly, it's just the time and the manpower necessary to do so. Uh, data points. Right now, data is our goal, you know, and that's why we've uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be, we've been pushing on our beta is like ask questions, every question. We actually had one of our uh, guys go uh, to for his uh, his niece's high school class, and we didn't realize he like gave him the code to go on the platform until we got a question that was a very interesting question: Why are nerds smelly? And that's when I knew. <laughs> That the next 50 or so questions, but again, what's interesting about our platform, and I think uh, one of the things we constantly remind our users, you know, there's a big concern about security, of, particularly, particularly with proprietary material on general AIs. Our system itself, we will not retain any of the nouns. We're only interested in the verbs. So we don't care about the secure word, the trademarks, anything. All we're teaching our system is the actions. Because ultimately, there's very few nouns that will bias a question or a conversation in a particular way. There's a whole lot of verbs and adjectives. Oh, sure. I was just asked, what is our go-to-market strategy? Uh, since obviously we're building APIs and everything else. Well, the API build and the plugins build and extensions, that's the next six to nine months. Our initial go-to-market strategies in the Ventural memberships, uh, think how uh, Grammarly or Calendly got off the ground. Monthlies for indip individuals. And we've already begun early conversations with enterprise-level clients. Uh, with enterprise-level clients, given the, uh, the versatility of our platform, we can actually co-build a direct thing for them without having to do too much work. One of the toughest things people always tell you is like, it's not scalable to custom build. It's very true, but it's easy to plug our platform in. Thank you. Let's give it up for Cog Bias. Yes. Mr. Tolly Shilton. Thank you, Tolly. So as we have our next presenters come up, I have one question for you all who's been here at Atlanta Tech Village before. When did Atlanta Tech Village start? Ooh. Oh. Yes. What's your name? Odie? Odie. Okay. Obi. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a good one. <laughs> rest in peace, Kobe. Yes. Rest in peace, Kobe. Thank Do you, you want to grab the shirt? Two shirts? Yes. I got two shirts. And now we owe one. Obi. And Jamie. Rest in peace. You ready? I'm just gonna, that's actually a liability in our in our building, so I can't. Do it. My boss is watching me right now. All right, Jamie, here you are as well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. So our next company coming up is Total Wellness Innovation. We have Mr. Jared Rhodes, Mr. James King, and Dr. Hari Athreya. You have stage four melanoma. That's what my doctor said, but not all he said, that's all I heard. He probably told me a lot more about my diagnosis and he probably told me my next steps. I didn't hear him though. Luckily, I'm six years in remission and it was, yeah. It was, uh, it was a hard and scary path. There was a lot of steps that I should have taken but didn't. There's a lot of steps my doctor told me to take and I just missed. I needed something to help me take ownership of my healthcare journey, to let me know what next steps to take and to let my doctor know what steps I was actually doing. Nothing like that existed. At Total Wellness Innovations, that is what we are creating. Welcome to Whole You. The practicing primary care physician I'm really frustrated with the amount of medical waste and inefficiency in our system. Computers and EMRs are overloaded with information. Physicians can't communicate well with each other and they don't know what they're doing. Uh, patients and physicians can't communicate well after their visits. After most patient visits, I see that patients can't tell you what their ne 
next steps are supposed to be. Moreover, why they are going to do those things or how they're going to get them done. This kind of chaos creates poor health literacy in our system. It also creates disengagement from a patient's own well-being. And when you repeat that cycle over and over again with different doctor's visits, you get a fragmented healthcare system that leads to frustrated users and poor health outcomes. So I present to you our app, WholeU, which is an app that not only streamlines clinical notes into our app, but also helps pay, uh, physicians with remote patient monitoring. It also improves patient adherence to medical plans by having reminders for appointments, imaging, and medication. Moreover, that chaos that most patients have after their doctor's visits gets turned into, with the help of our medical library, digestible and actionable health goals that also get turned into a gamified system that allows them to compete with peers and communicate with their physicians. All right, let's step into a demo. I'm gonna to have to hold a microphone and use a phone all at the same time, so please understand. I gotta get Windows to work with me as well. All right, you can see what I see. Let's step into whole you. On the home tab, when you open the application, you should see the most immediately actionable items or urgent care items that you're supposed to take care of. Let's say appointments, filling your medications, or any other items. You should also see current stats about the items that you are supposed to be monitoring. Let's say it's glucose, blood pressure, hydration, whatever your practicing physician told you to do. And then we go to the journey where we gamify those steps. So we try to keep the user engaged by giving them achievements so that they can track what they're supposed to be doing, reach those goals, and be given the new goals for the next part of their care plan. While we're also trying to help them take care of their medications, their appointments, and monitor their condition. Finally, we get into the fancier side of it, where we're actually using a, health co a digital health coach within the application. So we're not actually using AI to make any decisions. We're using the AI to take what's in the EMR and what is in your physician's notes and turn that into the items that you're supposed to do. But in your notes, your physician is not going to write, eat this, eat 500 milligrams of sodium per day. We also allow you to set your goals based on publicly available um, studies and uh, you get the idea. You can use the FDA guidelines if you need to use for you for tracking your um, um, meal plans. And then when you go and you use our app, it's actually smart enough to see and rank items for what you're supposed to do whenever you're supposed to do them. And I am running out of time. We also have a physician's portal. Um, and in that physician's portal, you can see the provider can see their whole patient population and what they're doing right. And I've got to get the computer back to the slides. <laughs> okay, so you will be able to see that the healthcare for uh, the market for healthcare apps is going up and will continue to go up. Uh, 17, 16% uh, growth since 2022 and 77% growth projected to, uh, by 2030. Uh, we really want, we're looking for funding to get into the market by 18 months. And we have a great team. Uh, we want to be autonomous. Uh, the great team is really talented. We have business, technology. I'm just going to keep talking until they tell me not to. Oh, oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's our great team. No, that's our team. That's not our team. All right. There it is. Questions. Is there any questions? From the <laughs> Uh, thank you. I do have questions. Um, so how do you make money? So we uh, charge per active user. So our go-to-market is with direct primary care physicians where they already pay a subscription fee. We'd be a part of that uh, subscription fee. Uh, we would take a part of that if they are an active user for that month. And then we also look to get into value-based care contracts. So we don't want to get into insurance first, but that is phase two. And then those insurers pay as we reduce their total uh, payouts for that uh, patient population. So the per, per physician, is that right? The, uh, per, pay, per active per, patient. How much per patient? Uh, we're $15 a month. Okay. 
Um, if you win, who, who loses? Because an app like this seems like a holy grail of patient information, you know, health decisions, pharmacy. So if, if you win, this has to replace something. Who loses? Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily agree that someone has to lose, but... With healthcare, someone will lose. Who loses? I think... <laughs> I think it depends on the degree of how much someone's going to lose and depending on the contract models that um, we're looking at. So if we're looking in a more fee-for-service schedule, I think there's less incentive to make sure that your patients are um, getting all their mammograms, your colonoscopies, getting their labs and getting that oriented. But I think as the system moves more towards um, a value-based a system where CMS is mandating more value-based contracts for clinics, I think the patient's goals and the insurer's and the clinic's goals are going to be aligned as uh, quality metrics become more important. I think the losers might be um, companies that are uh, benefiting from redundancy in the system. So if you, an x-ray imaging center, a uh, diagnostic lab, they're not going to have the same customer repeating the same labs four or five times, and rather they're going to have that uh, simplified in their patient care. Um, is there a possibility for introducing something for elder care where your parent who is aging, for example, <laughs> uh, gets advised to do something, but their caregiver doesn't necessarily know because they're not quite into the point where you have like medical authorization or something like that? Uh, that's a great question because I actually primarily spend most of the time with a primary care doctor as a geriatrician. And so, um, not by not naming names of where I work, uh, I see that all the time. I think the biggest question is I go into most uh, appointments and families, caregivers, patients themselves can't tell me what doctors are seeing, the names that they're seeing, um, and then you're relying on antiquated systems of communication like fax, phone numbers, on an overburdened system with staff that don't want to spend that time and understandably don't have the time to make those long, arduous processes. Um, and so I'll wrap it up there. And then within the app, yes, in our roadmap is a delegation feature for those who want to care for either their children, their parents, whoever they're allowed to delegate to. None. The question was, are we looking to get into EHR software? And the answer is a hard no. And for anyone that, that we have to work with in the future who isn't EHR, that's not what we want to do. We're not looking to replace EHRs. We only read. We don't write. Uh, the question was, uh, what is our plan for PAI and um, health data? And um, what was the second part? What do we plan on? How do we plan to secure it? Um, that's a longer question than I have time for. Uh, we're in the Microsoft uh, for AI Startups Partnership. I've been a Microsoft MVP for eight years in their cloud platform. So from a, um, from a platform perspective, we will use the platform from an organiz or an operations perspective, we have operation guidelines on how we handle the data and then how we uh, act on any breaches or any problems that occur in our systems. Is that what you were looking for? Thank you. And we're out of time. It's Woo! Give it a round of applause for Total Wellness, everybody. Jared Rolls, James King, and Dr. Hari. Thank you, Total Wellness. Do you see how much innovation is around us right here in Atlanta? Like, this is just a little, just a little snippet. We're very excited about who's coming to the stage next. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? No, wait a Me? Stage win. I might be going on stage. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to let them get set up. Sorry, guys. I thought I was <laughs> we're, we're 
we're rolling with it. At this we're rolling, everybody. Um, but FYI, as you leave out tonight, and we have three more pitches, this one and two more, there is a box you will see over there. What is this box? This box is called Tally Made by Sarah Lawrence. Sarah here? Is she here? Hey, Sarah, hey, wait, Sarah. Wait, 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 stand on up, Sarah, stand on up. Okay, so Sarah's in the back and it's just asking you questions about your experience here this evening. So please, when you have an opportunity, when you leave out, please fill that out. And in the meantime, we're gonna get off the stage. Eh? The stage, stage wing. wing, everybody. All right, as we get us, I'm a DJ and I wanna say, can y'all say, let me hear you say ho. If, it was, if you got twenty dollars in your pocket, put your hands up. Okay, that's that, those are our investors. Those are our investors right there. Yeah, just the twenty dollar pope. All right, y'all. My name is DJ Said the Saint, A.K.A. Said Joseph. I'm the founder of Stage Wing. I'm also an international DJ with plenty of experience, either doing small events as well as large events like the Essence Music Festival. I also have experience as a federal government contractor doing events management, and. I have seen a lot of events, but I've never experienced the same kind of anxiety that I've had in 2017, but I'll get to that story later. Hello, I'm Sean Johnson. I'm Stage Wing CTO. Um, I'm a software engineer with 25 years of experience leading technology teams, implementing diverse, high quality products. I'm a lover of technologies, dogs, cats, sometimes people. <laughs> All right, so back to that story I was telling you about. So in 2017, I was hired by this lovely couple to DJ their wedding. I traveled from Atlanta to Chicago, and when I got there, I noticed that TSA damaged an important piece of my gear. I must have called five different stores before finding the piece that I needed. I was lucky, but a lot of DJs aren't, and so when I got back to Atlanta, I hustled to, to solve the problem for my future self and other DJs. So let's look at the problem. First, number one, traveling with DJ gear is not Easy. I know you've seen a guitarist walk around the airport, but when have you seen a DJ with two turntables strapped to their back? You've never seen that. Also, you wouldn't believe how incredibly old school it is right now to rent equipment. Sometimes you have to call around two or three stores, get quotes, even have to be at the mercy of waiting, for, get waiting in line to get the equipment that you need. It's a real pain in the butt, basically. Also, setting up gear can be a pain. Those two speakers that you see on the screen right now are about 75 pounds each. Imagine getting to a party and have to go up a flight of steps with that and then finding the time to play it for four hours. It's a real buzz kill, y'all. And also, delivery for rental gear can be costly. Most traditional rental houses, it takes about two times more than the actual piece of gear. And in my customer discovery, I also found that a lot of DJs are just sitting on equipment that's not being used. And if they wanted to rent it out, they need to find customers. And how the heck are they going to figure out how to manage that process? So introducing Stage Wing, we solve all of those problems I mentioned earlier, and we help our members make money. So how does it work? So first, we have providers and renters. So providers are able to list their equipment. And once items are booked, they're able to get confirmation, and they can set up delivery time. For renters, you're able to find the equipment you need to rent, pay, and then get the equipment that you need. All right, so we also seeing traction already. We have 200 repeat customers. We're in 11 states, and on average, our renters can our providers can make 200 to 300 a rental, which is more than an Uber driver can make in a day. And also in 2023, we two times our annual revenue. As you can see, there's a lot of brands on here that we currently work with, and a special shout out to Atlanta Tech Village for being a partner. So why now, events are a constant part of business, personal, and social life. Y'all know what happened in 2020. We were all itching to get back out and be social, and you can also see the market projections are showing an uptick as well. And our current growth market, we're seeing that we want to continue to keep going. Right now, we're servicing the DJ market and some wedding events and corporate events, but we love to get into the festival market as well, too. And there are a number of players that are in our space, but no one is meeting our customer like we are, and we're just getting started, y'all. So our business model is we have three different tiers, from a basic to pro and enterprise. The prices scale accordingly. One of the big differences is the amount of items that you can rent per, uh, per tier. 
And none of this would be possible in terms of our success without our crew backstage. Shout out to them, they know who they are. So our ask today is to be our plug. We are looking to expand our team, so please refer us to someone. And if you really love us, please scan that code right now. Let us know how you want to support us. Be a, uh, another person who can be uh, a provider or a renter. Use our services. And we thank you for your time. Let's get this party started. We did good. 17 seconds. Any questions? So one of the challenges with a lot of rental services, I'm thinking about Rent the Runway, when you get things back in poor condition, obviously reviews help for the next time around, but what happens when you get something back that moment and it's in bad condition now and your equipment needs to be rented back out to somebody else? So that's a great question. We ask that all of our members have equipment insurance and usually it's the equipment that they're not using as their main source for their their setup. So it's the extra equipment that they have. So usually they have time to get it fixed. We have partners who do the maintenance on it and things like that. But uh, yeah, that's usually how it goes. Who's not your customer? Because my question was different until you said that we asked that they have insurance. And if this is going to feel like a turnkey solution, introducing insurance, it's a canary in the coal mine of higher expectations. So who, who is not your customer? Sorry, <laughs> who is not our customer? I think in-house production um, organizations that already have all the equipment and don't need the specialized abilities of our providers. One piece of feedback, raise your prices. Yes, we're, yeah, we're, we're, those are too low. Yep. And as you're going through these and we, every, each one of us kind of earmarks in our head what we would pay for, one based off of the problem that you solve and the cost associated, raise your prices. Thank you. Okay, following that wave of who is not your customer and all that good stuff. So you mentioned going from DJs into like festival rentals. Tell me a little bit more about that because that goes into something where it's like, that's a very different customer segment than me and you talking about we need turntables for tonight. Right, exactly. So right now, what we've already tested a little bit is that we've so we've served as BET awards. So a lot of times, the festivals will need like redundant equipment. We were talking to our friends over there about it. Um, so instead of just having one pair of turntables that, in case it may or may not work, you'll have additional equipment. So we act as a backline support system to the festival production crews. So to be clear, this is a clarifying question. You're talking about the DJs at the festivals, not necessarily the festival setup themselves, like when they need extra sound and all that other stuff. Um, both. Yeah, both. Um, it's not just, you know, we're highlighting the equipment aspect of it, but it's also the service, the bringing the equipment, the standing it up, the breaking it down. That is definitely part of what our providers, services that our providers offer. Like the door dash of equipment, essentially. Yes. Well, the question. That's a great question. So for concert level, yes, the question, sorry. The question was, uh, how can you help concert level artists get the equipment that they need? He has a friend that needs equipment a lot of times in various cities. So that's exactly what we do. We are in other cities right now. We have providers ready to support anyone who goes on our platform and looks for the equipment that they have in store for them. So. They can easily just go on our platform, find the equipment that they need, and that person will deliver it directly to them wherever they are within that city. Yes, we do need to talk. Yes, you. So 
the question was, we are mainly supporting DJs right now, but do we plan to support podcasters or any other uh, creatives that are looking for to, to post equipment on our platform? And also rent equipment? Yes, we would love to. We would absolutely love to. We, we believe that the podcaster community has the same types of needs that DJs need. Sometimes they need speakers, microphones, lights for their podcast if they're doing visuals, things like that. So yes. Yes, you. Most effective way that we've been finding customers has been a strong SEO. People will just go online and Google, I need uplights in Atlanta, or I need uplights in Austin. And that's where we, they usually find us that way. Hey! Congratulations. I have something me up, for y'all. Why did the DJ bring a ladder to their gig? So they can drop the beat. Wait a minute, what? What was the question? Why did the DJ bring a ladder to uh, their oh. gig? It was a dad joke, everybody. I tried. <laughs> Well, I will say thank you to Allie because I was so enthralled by the questions. I kept for saying, forget to say, repeat the question. So make sure you repeat the question. Um, <laughs> make sure to say that here. I know you are about to be set up. Is everyone enjoying this stuff so far? Awesome. Good, that makes me so happy. Well, we're so excited to present Intelligent Dots up next. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Austin Song, and I'm a representative of Intelligent Dots. Uh, we are a company that is dedicated to connecting the dots for the future of health and safety. Now, the patient monitoring market is a massive market. Uh, you guys may be familiar with some of these devices as shown on screen. On the left is a blood pressure device, uh, which many of you guys may have used when you go to a checkup. The doctor must put a cuff around your arm and then you'll be able to view your blood pressure data. On the right is the Apple Watch. Uh, you guys may use it to monitor your heart rate or respiration rate. However, what would you use if you wanted to contactlessly monitor your health, your health data while you're sleeping? Well, look no further. Our team at Intelligent Dots has developed a solution that we call BedDot. BedDot is an AI-powered zero-touch device that you can attach to nearly any surface. All you have to do is put it underneath um, the surface you want to detect your health data from. So let's say this is a bed. You could attach this underneath the bed, and when you lie on the bed, it'll be able to uh, give you all of your vital signs on one dashboard. Now, before I tell you about all bed DOS capabilities, I'd like to quickly introduce you to my dad. Uh, so this is my dad. Um, a few years ago, or a while ago, actually, uh, with the help of NASA and USGS, he was able to develop a sensor to monitor and detect volcano, uh, vol volcanic activity. And um, he was able to fly in the helicopter and drop the sensor into Mount St. Helens. And this was able to provide scientists with data to detect and uh, research volcanic activity. And while he was working on this project, he thought if this sensor is able to detect uh, the micro shifts in geologic activity, why can't it be used to monitor the human heart? Well, that's what we did with that thought. So with the help of a uh, National Science Foundation and the National Inst Institute of Health, we were able to shrink this high-tech device into the size of about two decks of playing cards. But don't let a small size uh, fool you. So since the last one and a half years that we came here, we've been able to conduct our 100 patient clinical trial. And we found that our accuracy meets the FDA requirements. And we're currently FDA pending. All the vitals it can display is heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate. Uh, it can also detect your movement and whether you're on or off the bed. We've also developed two new versions since we last came. The first time I came, we came with version one, which is the large bulky white case you see on the very left. And then we developed a second version where we reduced the cost, made a smaller case, added magnetic mounting, and we improved the dashboard and added the ability to detect blood pressure. But now we have version three, 
and we're manufacturing our own sensor and circuit boards. So we've been able to reduce our costs by a lot. We've also incorporate, incorporated the magnetic mounting into the case. You can see the magnets on the case. Uh, and we've also now added alerts uh, that use um, AI to detect any problems. And bed doll is also not limited to just beds. Like I said earlier, it can be attached to nearly any surface. You can attach it under seats. Uh, it can also be used in cribs for babies. However, babies have a different uh, set of data, so we have a different set of, um, we have a different AI algorithm for monitoring their vitals. We've also been testing it on animals. Uh, you can see we've used it on lab rats. On the right is a cat that we have at home. Uh, my brother made that house for him, so we put it underneath it. Yeah, and we've been partnering with some vet hospitals to do the research. Uh, I'd like to show you a demo real quick. So our user would be able to uh, view all the data on one centralized dashboard. Uh, we have two devices. The one in blue is actually a device I attach under the seat right there. My dad is sitting on it. Uh, it says in bed, but it should be in seat. But it's fine. Uh, when I click on it, yeah, you can see all the data. Um, it shows all the movements and whatever. But th this isn't as accurate as if you were to lay on a bed because on here, when you say your heart is all the way up here, it's more accurate if your heart is closer to the sensor, which is why I also have one prepared for the device we have at home. Okay, so this, this device is attached underneath the bed we have at home. And you can tell from looking at the data that this person had a really good sleep. Uh, the decreases in uh, blood pressure shows that, yeah, they were in deep sleep. And you can also click on these to view individual data. So you said zero touch. In a world of Apple Watches and Whoop Bands and Aura Rings that are I've got two of the three on my body right now. I don't know what that says about me. Um, what's the key benefit for being zero touch? So zero touch is beneficial because um, this is mainly for beds, right? So if you're using an Apple Watch, uh, most people would have to take it off to charge it when they go to sleep. And wearing like any wearable can cause uh, irritation or rashes if it's worn too long. So what happens when you have two people in one bed? So we're working on, um, we have an algorithm that can separate the data, uh, but it's still kind of in testing. Right now it's mainly for one person, but it is definitely possible to uh, separate the data between two people with just one device. Okay, so I have some oddly specific questions that I'm gonna take offline because y'all are left, I've seen this before, we've met. Um, and I've seen how this has grown since you first pitched me about a year ago. And we need to talk about your former co-founder potential. We need to talk about that. Um, that said, I want to get back to Landon's question about the contactless piece. Let's be clear, is this for us to use at home, like a consumer device? Or is this more for the medical field? Let me address this. So. It can be used for any people. And so we currently target like senior care, baby care, and animal care. The reason I say ordinary people would benefit from this is, this is related to that today, we only do annual checkup once per year, right? But in the future, this, this device get into the daily home. Essentially, every night we're doing a health checkup. And those data build up would enable predictive care in a preventive, the hairs uh, become bigger in a hospital problem. Thank you.
very good question. So yeah, this uh, you, you know there is a oh sorry uh, the question is uh, whether this device could also recognize unique features of each person, basically person identification, who is on the bed, right? So currently we didn't do that yet, uh, but this is something uh, related to biometric recognition. So people have doing this like with PVG. So this is, can also be done with this kind of device. We just haven't done this kind of research, so I cannot say, you know, evidence, but uh, you know, whatever you can done with those PVG wearable stuff, we can do similar with this device. In fact, I have another nice, uh, you know, a patent that was doing the human recognition who walking on the ground for the, the floor activity recognition as too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so currently we basically have this Weber app. Yeah, this one could also run on mobile phone but we were thinking of Karnan is a, you know, if you're familiar with the Grafana panel, we wish to develop some more user friendly, maybe targeting different vertical market. We need some customized designs. Yeah, yeah. So I forgot to mention that we just look for, particularly we look for people who can contribute to those mobile app development. Secondly, we look for technical support people who could, because we are doing beta testing on variety of senior care facilities right now, so we need people to be able to go there, do support, yeah. Um, yeah, third thing, we're looking for a partner uh, for be able to directly reach market, not sales, necessarily sales person, but uh, who directly have the market access. So those are three things we particularly look for right now. Yeah, so the question is uh, whether there is any competitive market uh, product on the market with uh, all the same function we have. Uh, second question he asked is uh, uh, what's the price point of this uh, device? Okay, so the, for the first question, there are some SNP monitoring uh, device uh, product on the market, like Apple have purchased one several years ago. Um, but those, none of those things, first of all, none of them Today can do blood pressure monitoring. We will be the world first one be able to do blood pressure monitoring without a contact body. Okay. So we are currently going through the FDA process right now. Uh, they also uh, even forgot about the blood pressure, the rest of the function, those existing devices typically require a good installation that have to be under the like a belt, have to be under hard. If the body movement move around, they wouldn't be able to detect. So for seniors, they, you know, they have weight beta problem. Or babies have weight beta problem, so those can be a challenge. Regarding the price point, so this device, our current market uh, strategy is that the hardware basically is a very minimum charge. Uh, we were, we have the, you know, the device back when we're thinking around the hundred to one hundred fifty dollar, uh, but we're for those. Uh, like a senior care facility, we mainly wanted to do the monthly subscription fees. Yeah, thank you. Intelligent Dots, thank you very much, everybody. So we have one final pitch for the evening, and I don't know about you, Richard, but I feel like smarter by osmosis listening to everyone. I'm literally smart enough. I mean, seriously, we've got, what do we have first? We had bias. Hog bias. Right? Come on. Total wellness. Total wellness. So helping us make sure we know what we're doing with our body. We're taking those directions, which is funny because I just went into my my chart and had it out with my doctor yesterday. <laughs> because you go in and you ask specific questions and you're like, I want to know X, Y, Z. And then they don't answer them. So I'm like, I have a history of this in my family, yada, yada, yada. And then we went to the book of DJ. <laughs> Stage wing, everybody. Right. And, and then intelligent jobs, helping with health. 
So we're gonna close out tonight with Cosmic. Take it away, Howard Brothers. Cosmic, Cosmic. Hello. I love when we get built up of all these intelligent people and cool industries. Then we're talking about swag. I mean, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, this is Cosmic. My name is John Howard. This is my brother, Jamie. Um, I'm going to move the slides. I realize I'm doing that. Yeah. So uh, a couple of years ago, we presented Slingshot. It was at kind of its infancy state. We presented it here. So if you've seen the logo, that's probably why. Um, we currently work with some really cool companies that you know we've grown tremendously over the last few years. Um, we're making, storing, and shipping swag all over the world for some really awesome companies to their individuals, to their own team members, um, to 330, whatever it is, destinations. So it's pretty crazy. Um, we know, though, with swag, it is a very, very heavy commitment when you're trying to think through this. So you're going through the idea of what kind of swag do we want for our company? Um, where do I want it to go to? What is the point of the swag getting out there? What kind of budget do I have? And it's not really an experimental thing you could work through. Um, so you're end ending up with a very heavy commitment that you're stuck with. And we see a lot of that with our customers, like, hey, get rid of this big shipment for us, clear out some of this inventory, et cetera. So three months ago, I had a call that came through our website and um, just like normally, I want to schedule a demo. And as the great salespeople in here know, usually two to three minutes inside of a call, you know they're not a good fit or they are. So I was through that call. Um, I was kind of letting them down gently and lovingly as I always do, try to be nice and loving. Um, but towards the end of the call, they're telling me about, man, we really want to work with Slingshot. We've heard so much stuff about Slingshot, your referral, et cetera. Um, but we don't want to pay all the fees. We don't want to pay for storage. We don't want to pay for swag up front. We don't want to pay for fulfillment each time something goes out the door. And so, again, I lovingly let them down that that's not a good fit for us, but I will try to help you find a way that fits. Um, they left us with this thing is like, I want to see swag as an experiment. That was the big quote they said is, I want to experiment with swag. I don't want to commit to anything. Um, I love that. We talk about that in all the industries, marriage, et cetera, right? Um, so the funny thing is, I love my wife. She knows it. She's watching. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble when I go home, right? Uh, so they were saying, I want to experiment with that. So introducing Cosmic, that is the new platform. Three months later, I'm talking to Jamie. I'm like, I cannot get that. I want to experiment phrase out of my head with swag. Is there anything we could build that would facilitate not a, not a cheaper customer, but a customer that wants to play around first and then grow into swag with Slingshot. Um, so again, Cosmic came apart from that conversation. It's basically a print-on-demand swag giveaways that get you more of something. So any founders that are doing all the hats in here tonight, they do everything, they don't have a team? Okay, solo founders, right? Um, that's pretty common is you don't have different departments, but swag and cosmic or swag companies and cosmic are slightly different. As I explained for swag companies such as Slingshot, we're kind of fighting ourselves tonight, right? Um, you're paying for swag up front, you're paying for storage costs, you're paying for fulfillment. That means someone picking and packing it and getting it ready to go to international customs and get out the door. Um, and there's usually a two to three week turnaround to get swag to your doorstep to even start that experiment. With Cosmic, it's different. You're paying per shipment only when someone redeems a gift. There are zero storage costs. There's zero fulfillment costs, two to three day turnaround. That means in someone's hand shipping out. Um, the way that works is you first choose your swag. We have a growing catalog. We're working constantly right now, fervently, with partners that can do on demand. We're working with pie companies. We're working with uh, candy companies. We're working with non-branded items as well. So part of that is we've got this limited edition. We slap some logos on there, but you can get pretty much anything you could think of instantly and as a one-off purchase running through our platform. Secondly, going back to the experiment phase, choose your experiment. What do you want to do with the swag? Again, you're wearing all hats. Go back one. You're wearing all hats. If you're in product, you want more reviews for giving away swag. If you're in sales, you want more book calls. I love that one. If you're in marketing, you want more posts on social for your company. If you're in community, get people into the community and engaging more. Lastly, when this is all bundled up, you've picked out your swag, you picked a purpose for the swag, you can now start experimenting, you're sending out a link. The link looks like this, you're gonna try it in just a second, it's really fun and it's free. Um, you get to go fill out a form, it takes less than 15 seconds, we track this through Full Story, another Atlanta company we love. Um, and then lastly, after they're done you know, filling it out and getting the free swag, we then ask them to do the uh, call to action. In this case, if you want somebody to jump on a call, we're gonna schedule with Calendly. They can close out of the window, they can leave, they don't have to do it. But we want to track that. And the reason is you don't want to get a thousand people signing up for something for swag. And then you got to go kind of break through that list and try to go, who's actually a good customer of ours? These people choose to do the call to action afterwards. This has worked crazy wonders for us. We've been tracking this now for a few months. 
So you'll be able to see inside your dashboard the amount of entries that came through each form, so your experiments, right? The number of clicks on the CTA, so in this case, they clicked on Calendly, they wanna book a call, and how many of those people did that? So stop throwing money out into the void, um, try a different way where you're actually tracking your experiments. And lastly, I'm almost last, last slide, never pay for bulk swag, it's all done, never pay for storage, never pay for fulfillment, two to three day turnaround. And we're in closed beta until tonight, um, go back one, we're in closed beta until tonight, we have 10 beta customers right now, $6,500 in revenue. This is outside of Slingshot. It's a brand new product that we're releasing. Lastly, this is what we need from you. We just want you to try it out tonight. There's going to be no onus on you to do anything. Uh, put your phone up. You will get something for free. I promise there's no responsibility on you. If you want to, click on that call to action at the end. Questions? Tell me about the competitive landscape. <sighs> we're bootstrapped. These companies are letting go of their teams in major that are competitors with us. Um, we get customers from SwagUp, Swag.com, Sendo, so Print Faction. I'm not trying to put them on blast, but we're getting customers from them because they don't want to work with those types of swag management companies. Um, we're local here in Atlanta. All of our teams are local. We have no network to ship all your stuff out. It's all local. We handle everything top to bottom. We own our own warehouse, et cetera. Um, so competitive landscape's huge. I mean, you've got to even get the four imprints. People, you can buy swag on your own if you want to. We do all of that for you. The platform, though, is our unique piece put something into an experiment phase, get results back from it. Don't just spend money and go, man, I hope they hold up my mug on their call and show people about my company. Nobody does that. Nobody goes and asks about that on calls. So what we do is really try to get it into an experimental phase where you put something out into the void, it comes back and gets you something, more calls, et cetera. I may have missed it because you got very enthusiastic. At yes, Micro Machines talking today. Tell me a bit more about how you guys make money off of this. So we have markups on the product and you pay a monthly fee. Monthly fee is you get three experiments or product giveaways for $49 a month or it's $129 for unlimited. Of the breakdown I gave you, one person's currently on our $129 plan, the rest are on the $49. Is this a lead gen for Slingshot? It's, yeah, we use it for ourselves. Go to our website on useslingshot.com. We're using Cosmic at play for us. Yeah, we get calls all the time for that. Okay, and what are, that's a quick turnaround time. It's really fast. How? Like, is this a distraction? That's our magic. Is, is, like, it, is this itself a distraction or is this, your, our, is this your own experiment within an experiment? Like we're inception. We've rebuilt an entire platform to work within Slingshot's platform. That's our proprietary hidden information, but it feels like magic because it is. Uh, we've spent a lot of time rebuilding our platform to do that. People behind? There's people or is... What's that? There's people behind? Like, is there, you know, Julie sitting at a desk waiting for a thing to come in to design and... Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So th there are actually networks of print-on-demand services. That's like, that's like a well-established uh, thing. There's a bunch of companies that do that. What we have done is wrapped a whole platform around it for the giveaway portion of it. So you can go and get, like, custom Chuck Taylors printed and have them in, at your, your recipient's doorstep and, like, let, I mean, it'll it'll ship in three days, but you know where they're based in the world is obviously how long it take. But there there's there's international partners that we've worked with where you can print the thing in Germany to have it sent in Germany. And so what we've done is built the platform on top of that, and we're working with a bunch of network of providers to say like, hey, you're over here, you create like he said like pies, you create candy over there, you create these things, and that way we can brand them. So yes. So how broad is our catalog with the inventory? How, how depthy is that? We're being very careful with that. Print on demand notoriously is known for bad quality. And the reason that is, it's using direct to garment printing, sublimation, et cetera. We're used to doing very high end stuff or very high end clients as you saw before. We're very protective over that. What we're realizing though with this demographic, they're in testing phase. It's still gonna look awesome. It's not gonna be a hand pulled screen print. It's not gonna be an embroidery that matches Pantone exactly. It's gonna be very close to all that and they're getting close. Parity is coming. Um, we're way ahead of that on this point, but we're being very careful. So right now we're at about 150 items that we love and feel okay about. Um, but again, you're in an experiment. You're trying to get more views. You're trying to get more likes, more posts, and more uh, bookings. I thought somebody over here. Yes, go ahead. Obi, right? Boom. Yeah. It, okay, what does swag stand for? Stuff we all gets the joke from Michael Scott on the, yeah, it's a little corny, it's cheesy, but it's the number one search term for SEO. Branded merchandise is another one as well. 
We got one over here, I think. How much time we got? 47 seconds. Yeah, you're asking, is it, do we still maintain our turnaround time? It's not guaranteed, but we're pretty quick. And it's actually monitored. All the teams we're working with, we give them scores, and they're monitored on accuracy, quality, et cetera, and turnaround time. That's one part of it. I saw one up front. It was right here, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Are we worried about this cannibalizing our existing business? It's the easiest thing I've ever sold. Let me say that when I jump on a call with someone and I transition them into really high quality swag, they get that. Most of the people we're working with are newsletters right now. Beehive is a customer of ours and all of their people are now working with us for that. Uh, five seconds, go, fastest ever. How do you know I'm not printing what? Like if you're copywriting something, we monitor all that. So. Are they copywriting something? How do we monitor that? We monitor all of your transactions at a redundancy of like four levels. Um, so you cannot publish anything with us that is not previously viewed by our team. That's it. Appreciate you guys. This was awesome. Thank you, Cosmic. Round of applause, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Having a good night tonight, everybody? Awesome. Again, my name is Richard. I'm the membership coordinator here at Atlanta Tech Village. I'm going to have Christian come up because we have something special for us. All right, everybody? We're going to take a selfie. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, what? What's so special? Um, so the judges are deciding. You see them whispering amongst themselves. So make sure I don't fall off. I got you. I got you. I got you. It's y'all. Y'all are not going to have me on TikTok like, look who fell in Atlanta. No, we're not doing that. All right, so we're gonna. This is a video. We're gonna start over here with our companies. Hey! hey. <laughs> All right, so we've got like a minute left, and I'm gonna give you another reminder. But there's a box. Wave. She's standing right next to the box. She's like me. Yeah, you wave. <laughs> okay, so you see her right there. The box is right there. So when you are leaving out, I like it. You went. Banner white on me, I love it. So when you're walking out, make sure that you give feedback. Thank you so much, Stephanie Lawrence, for bringing this in. It's, it's so cool. Like, it's literally push button, go, next person, go. So we have one more giveaway. Yes, we do. What do we have? Some more merch, everybody. Just one more. What? And I mean, throw a good sticker in there, too. Oh, I've got some stickers. OK. I got so what is one thing someone's excited about for? <laughs> That's not swag <laughs> for spring. Now that it's spring, minus this pollen. What's one thing you're excited for? Go ahead. Oh, do you have a convertible car? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll all get your number and sign up for a ride after the pollen ceases. <laughs> well, it looks like our judges have a winner. And first of all, before we announce it, let's give it up for all of these amazing yes. companies. <laughs> They are building right here in Atlanta, and make sure you support them, get their social. I'm so excited. All right, guys. Did we say you, I'm joking, Gabe. I know him, <laughs> I know him. So they win the opportunity to come back for a pitch off, and after the pitch off, the winning company gets a year membership here, including parking. We know now in Atlanta, you have to pay to park everywhere. So, and a year of parking. So it is a 13,000 dollar value that they can win. Great question, Gabe. Just messing with you. Oh, I want a year of parking. Uh -uh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right? OK, so it was very, very close. It took a lot of thought and deliberation because we had so many amazing companies. We have decided that Total Wellness. Uh, congratulations. Congratulations. Come on up, Total Wellness. Come on up, Total Wellness. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you guys so much for coming. Remember, we're now on a quarterly basis. Check Meetup. Check Eventbrite. Feel free to come talk to the companies afterwards. Make sure to sign the Tally. Tally made. Tally made. The box. And thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you in a quarter. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tonight.